Good morning. My name is Peter Stanley. I'm uh, the uh, managing director of Peter Stanley Training. My background in fire. I was a fire commander at level four for many years. Over to you, Ian. Yeah, good morning, uh, Ian Eldridge. Uh, previously and formerly from the NHS within the ambulance service, um, many years, particularly with resilience and specialist operations. Um, and good morning. All right. Well, what's up? We're going to be talking EPRR today, aren't we? So uh the uh minimum occupational standards really and uh how that might be achieved what's your view really of the standards and possibly where trusts are at the moment in your professional view so command and control is nothing new really for the nhs uh, and by the nhs i'm talking ambulance services acute trusts community health, um, uh, mental health, and, and right the way across the board and, and the wider, bigger NHS. Uh, so commander control is nothing new really within within that, that big area. And I say it's a very vast area. Um, it's making sure that uh, the core standards are complied with and that the, those that are undertaking the command roles are competent and can prove um, pretty much evidence that they are able to undertake that. Um, with regard to the individual trust, I think it's very wide uh, areas that some are already pretty much fully compliant, but there are a number that have really pushed this to one side. And I think that's really where there's a, going to be and has been a change because of recent incidents over the last few years, particularly. Yeah, so I mean, the EPR standards only came out in June 22, didn't they? So um and effectively really looking at the documents need to be complied with by july 23 so it's not a great there's not a great uh, amount of time really to 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 achieve compliance is there and, and that again is is one of the the real um issues is that you know as you say this is required by the first of uh, first of july is my understanding um and and it's pretty clear what standards are required so you know we've got the standards themselves so the minimum occupational standards which are referred to within the um within the EPRR world as such so by EPRR just in case emergency preparedness resilience and response um is you know and, and the framework is really what we're working to um that there are a, a number of um national occupational standards you know which also through skills for justice that clearly identify what what the skills are and what the competencies are and how they're measured against the, the individual um, but it's not also the individuals it's actually the trusts themselves that need to have in place um, systems that they can put in you know it, that come into being should an incident occur it's so really from the perspective of my many years in fire service training it's it's really bringing the nhs into alignment with what goes on in fire uh police and also most ambulance services in terms of the skills for justice standards in terms of the um the mentions of jessup throughout the document um so that there's probably one working one working process for all of the what you might call category one responders including nhs of course uh, that's going to mean training strategic tactical and operational commanders really at this stage i think so how do you think people are approaching it in nhs in terms of sourcing and um and completing that training so from from my part the legislation behind it is uh, an awful lot based on the civil contingencies act um which really makes the requirement for the nhs to show that it can deal with incidents and maintain services in, in the event of the incidents occurring and it's from that that, um, as I say, we've already got experience that a number of the um, regions within the NHS have already got a certain amount of um, kind of control in place. But it's actually identifying exactly where where there needs to be improvement, I would suggest. Um, in, in the past, um, um, when we're going through, as I think everyone is quite clearly aware from the, the, the media, a particularly difficult time in the NHS, but that's not really just recent. That's actually been building up over a number of years. Um, and unfortunately, I think um, it, it's, it's my opinion that a lot of the, well, a lot of the, the individual trusts have actually put a lot of their command training to one side to actually deal with those patients that are coming through the door there and then and not actually working out that in the future, 
it could be a, a significant incident, and I'm going to say significant is probably in the wrong term here, but whether it be a critical incident or a major incident, um, that they need to have that competency in place. And I think that's where, um, from a Peter Stanley point of view, is that we can get involved and actually make sure through experience with the fire service training, because that's really um, a good grounding. And, it's, and I think that's where the NHS could learn from fire and rescue. Yeah, I guess... Um, um, your NHS um, senior managers have dealt with many crises over the last few years. And I think crisis is really probably something that's going to phase them, but it's really about risk, organisational risk, isn't it? So if you look at some of the warnings from history, we've had particularly fire service, for example, and police, uh, Manchester Arena, Borough Market, um, you know, Grenfell, uh, for the deficiencies that were found on all those occasions, some um, people, strategic managers lost their jobs. Absolutely. And so there is a risk that, you know, that ethos will be applied to the health service at some point to the trust when a strategic commander maybe makes mistakes and people where uh, the incident doesn't go as well as it should. Uh, certainly in all the other emergency services now, there is a culture that um, heads roll at the top when those major incidents go wrong. So Manchester Arena, Chief Forrest lost his job, was asked to retire. Uh, same for London, for Grenfell. Severe criticism at Borough Market. So I wonder if the NHS trust really, not just the ambulance service, but the, the other elements of the trust, acute and so on, are actually taking the risk seriously in terms of not complying to EPRR. Mm. Uh, and not managing the instance in what we would see, and you've worked with us now for long enough, um, in 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 a uh, particular process, Jessup. Yeah, and that's that's really where I think um, the wider NHS it needs to come into line with, particularly the emergency services, and and it's not just emergency services that came in. So Jessup joint emergency services interoperability principles. Um, yeah. We we've worked to that. You know, certainly for a number of years now, and and it has proven itself that it that it actually improves the outcome of an ins of an incident and those that are involved in it. Um, and and this I think is also where within the the wider NHS the, those principles need to be brought into play. And you know, we, we know that from the from Jessup itself, we use um, particularly for any decision making the joint decision model. Yeah. Um, that that JDM cycle can actually be used. On an, uh, internally, um, individually, even um, it's not a case of actually has to be out there for for joint purpose use, um, and and that to me is also with within the the NHS there is not as much experience of working with external partners. So through the um, local resilience forums, in the event of an incident occurring, um, they would norm uh, and depends whether you know the, the nature of the incident, but it could well be formed a, a, a TCG a tactical coordination group or a strategic coordination group. Now, my understanding is that um, those would normally be attended to through the um, through the ICB, so the Integrated Care Board, you know, um, yeah. set up originally previously the um, CCGs um, clinical commissioning groups. But there is still that need for commanders within the NHS to actually have the understanding of how to work with external partners um, at all levels. Uh, you know, if, if you really base it down to, um, let's say, someone dropping a canister in the car park of uh, one of the acute trusts A&E departments, that could develop into either a, a hazardous material incident or a, a CBRN, clinical, biological, radiological, nuclear incident. Uh, you know, there would be uh, acute trust uh, involvement and engagement at command levels, particularly externally as well as internally. Um, and that's where I think the, again, the, the Jessup principles come into play. Uh, and it's getting that education across to everyone that that's how we all work, uh, yeah. common terminology from that. So the methane, which again has been incorporated within the NHS um, yeah. for declaration of an incident. Um, that, that's how I would see it anyway, Peter. Yeah. I mean, would you see day to day in given the current sets of emergencies that are going on in various trusts around um, patient care and whatnot, would you see people in the trust itself um, taking the uh, the Jessup aid memoir out of their pockets and using the joint decision control and joint decision model in a tactical meeting inside the trust? I would say at this day and age, 
Probably not, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's, again, as I've said previously, I think that's where good learning will come to place. And actually, by using Jessup principles, we also come out with joint learning, um, which actually is then put forward for you know, the, the national interest. So I think that's where, you know, it, it could play a good part. But no, unfortunately, I don't think if, if you actually mention Jessup to a number of NHS commanders, they probably wouldn't actually understand what you were talking about. Um, I'd, yeah. I'd like to think I'm wrong on that, but I think from my own experiences, um, still a, gr a great number haven't actually had that uh, yeah. that knowledge you know, put it you know, put to them. Yes, I mean it's um, we know from bitter experience in the public inquiries, the uh, the barristers will only concentrate on um, process. So if you haven't put process into place in accordance with PPRR or whatever it is you're doing that's where they normally focus. So there's a big training need there if people don't either understand it or don't use it. Second thing I've noticed really is that these, there's not much emphasis on accreditation. So the, the EPR are courses that we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're um, um, putting out at the moment are all accredited CPD courses to the Continuing Professional Development Office. So it gives it some external quality assurance. And I think the EPR guidance actually says that it should be accredited training. So Absolutely. Is, does that actually something that people major on in, in trust, ambulance service trust or in NHS itself, acute trust and so on? I would say, again, my main experience has really been related to the ambulance um, trusts and certainly any command training that, that is delivered um, or those that are put in place to undertake command roles. Uh, would go through some form of accredited course, whether it be through um, you know, the National Ambulance Resilience Unit or uh, additional um, university-based uh, uh, trainers. But it, it's uh, the wider NHS. I, I'm, today, I, I couldn't really comment on that. Um, my, my understanding is that certainly it's at levels, uh, you know, a number of st uh, strategic commanders would have actually undertaken the magic course, multi-agency gold instant command courses, um, and through resilience forums, a lot of those also uh, deliver accredited uh, command training, but places on those are extremely limited. And that's yeah. one of the biggest issues um, within, the, within the whole country is that there are limited places available for this command training. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, with, with the date in mind of the uh, 1st of July, that's where there are difficulties, I yeah. think. Yeah, I mean, if if trusts were looking to put senior managers on magic courses, for example, there's, there's a waiting list of, uh, well over a year for one of those so um you know that, that if they're going to source training it needs to be deliverable to quite a number of people very quickly doesn't it absolutely there are uh, additional courses which come to complement uh, magic and so on so particularly within the nhs there is a course called strategic leadership in crisis again very very short course that um and obviously it's it's delivered through um uh the health security agency originally um but again places and, and numbers of those are very limited um and this is where i think there is yeah as we've already said there is a need for training out there for the individual trusts bearing in mind i think one particular trust we looked at um at a tactical level they had somewhere in the region of 60 to 70 um, members of staff that needed that level of training um strategic i think it was a lot less but somewhere in the region of 12 to 15 Again, my own experiences are that that actually needs to be increased because in times of, let's say, a flooding type incident, you could have representation at any number of tactical level meetings or strategic level meetings. And it's ensuring that you've got people with designated authority that can actually represent yeah. your trust. I mean, uh, you know, we've seen many times in the fire service, the time the crisis occurs, the people that you had trained aren't there. You need others others yes. to step in who've had training the other thing that's been interesting in this project really is you know we i mean working with you we've realized immediately that how much pressure the nhs is under every day of the week mm. the, you know, in terms of you know the number of patients and the, the, the various critical incidents that occur almost in you know every day in different hospitals um is about the amount of time that they've got to devote to training. So one of the things we have developed alongside the venue-based courses, which are 
in our catalogue, of course, that, uh, that we send out to anyone who's interested, but um, is to produce some very short online courses, three hour courses, which again are accredited to um, CPD, uh, to the CPD office, so they get an accredited certificate for it. What do you think the the attitude of particularly strategic and tactical managers might be to sitting down and doing that online training? I would say that they would probably welcome those with open arms, um, because as you've already um, alluded to, that time is extremely precious within the NHS in in any any yeah. parts of it at the present time. Um, I don't agree with rushing things uh, as as a personal, but on the other hand, I would say that that very basic form of um, command training is a real need and it will then start um, it opens the door essentially for further education um, as and when time permits and I think um, in, again my, in my own opinion at least then you can go into an incident or, or even on a daily basis you've got that um, background that you can actually utilize the training from it and also refer to it should someone question your competency at any stage because you know that's where we we see from Grenfell the poor officers that were um held to account um were put through quite a grilling I would suggest yeah they were, they went through the mill there like they expect that to happen when they have an instant like that of course and uh, it does expose every single gap in the organization in terms of training development how it's organized how they run the major instance and so on it's yeah. forensic for those that that uh, that um, watch it like I do, what you, you you may do. So mm. it's, it's pretty clear, I think, that in as we move forward, the NHS are now going to be measured against a standard, which is EPRR. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's another instant like Borough Market or Manchester Arena, uh, the measurement won't be whatever process the trust has in place. It will be how much they complied with EPRR. As you can see from the arena, the only constant set of questions that were that were posed at the at the inquiry to fire officers and police officers and ambulance commanders was Jessup, which is the recognised civil contingencies uh, code of practice, really, for category one responders. Of course, the NHS is part of that. So I'm not sure. I don't know what you feel, but I'm not sure whether people in the NHS particularly source this kind of training have really grasped the level of risk involved there. No, I, I, personally, I don't think they have. And, uh, you know, with, with any commander, they need to be looking forward as to what the risks are that they need to possibly you know, attend to. So it's very much open as to we're actually looking at not just their own risks in within their own environment, within the, the hospital, for example, but actually from a national risk uh, register basis. Um, yeah. And the training would actually open again um, more doors to this because uh, a lot of time this is actually just a, a forgotten area. Um, and, and even, for example, future planning um, and the involvement from commanders that are particularly you know, suitably trained. Um, with, with Kemp, for example, over a number of years, I'm sure everyone loves the word Brexit. Um, the amount of planning that was involved in that was incredible. And I, you know, I would love to know the amount of hours of just local resilience forum meetings. Um, and I really, I, I haven't got any idea, only that I went on a large number of them. But so did a number of my NHS colleagues. Um, and it was often the case that we shared responsibility between you know, various trusts as to who was going to be represent because it came down to what amount of time could be given to that. So I think it's very much um, a, a case of it's not just internal to one's own trust and one's own building, but actually the wider element of it. Yeah, I think, you know, the Jessup Doctrine changed obviously in December last year. Mm -hmm. One of the things that imposed on LRFs now is their set of standards. So yeah. even if, uh, you know, an NHS commander is 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 at an LRF, um, they'll be judged against those sets of standards. So you can see where the thrust of government, if you like, is going with this. It's mm -hmm. all about standards and accreditation and accountability. So I think, you know, what comes to mind is, I know there's this year's deep dive is um, mass evacuation, I think, which is something we do mm -hmm. quite a lot, as, you, as you're well aware from yeah. working with us um for the nhs um but um if you you know if you 
if you look at the range of incidents, it's, it's only a matter of time before there'll be an MTA in a hospital, awesome. a terrorist attack in a hospital. Yeah, It's just a matter of time. So, you know, I don't know whether they concentrate on what's happening now, for example. So, you know, when hospitals become overcrowded, a major incident get declared and sorts of things happened, whether that's the thing they practice, sort of things that we would consider as... Um, um, high risk, low frequency events. In other words, things that haven't yet happened. I wonder how they, how that training is concentrated on in terms of the simulations. So there's a lot of simulation. There's a lot of incidents that I can see that will happen in hospitals that haven't yet. That's for sure. Uh -huh. A major flooding event, for example, uh, an MTA yeah. incident. MTA, what we mean by MTA is a is a is a marauding terrorist incident. In other words, somebody with a knife or several people with knives running a mock in a hospital. It's just a matter of time, I think. Uh, and whether they practice that kind of event, um, because particularly at strategic level, it's really about horizon scanning. It's not about practicing the events you know happen every day. So when the hospital becomes very overcrowded, they, they, they know how to deal with that, you know, as far as possible. But what about the other events that they have that haven't really reared their head nationally in England anyway, in the UK? And and that's where I think there is a lot more scope and, and a lot more understanding is required within the NHS, whether it be acute um, community health and so on. Um, certainly with, with regards to um, marauding terrorist type attacks or, or even to you know, down to your your lone wolf, as it were, the single person perpetrator that, that has been experienced. I mean, for example, last two years or so ago there was an incident at one of the brighton hospitals where actually uh, someone was was found to be in one of the uh, the buildings there running a mock with with a knife and luckily um very very low number in fact i think there's only one or two people in the end that were actually injured but that could have gone horribly wrong it was it was wrong in the first place so they are there um and i was actually involved on that particular one as part of the command group for that um and again, that's where it comes in. And with every incident, I think it comes up is what was the first thing that didn't work so well? And it's usually communication. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, again, as a commander uh, at all levels, you need to have a, your hand on exactly what and how you are talking to each other with regards to that. Um, also, with, for example, you, you mentioned flooding. We've had a number of experiences of that in recent years. And again, the NHS is very much involved um, at tactical and strategic group meetings. Um, so it's, it's again making sure that those that are attending A, are competent, but are also comfortable. Um, uh, and it's my experience that a lot of people will attend a meeting um, that have had very little experience or little exposure to these. And it's giving them that, um, how to say that, that, that comfortable feeling that they can attend they do know what they're on yeah. about they do know how to integrate with the others on, on that panel um sorry on the um at the meeting even down to possibly chairing um exactly. and which is uh yeah one of those um areas that nobody likes being put in out of their comfort zone well actually there, there are a few people that enjoy it i think but uh, in the main i think most would prefer someone else to say actually yeah please you can take the control of that one or fire you've got the you know the the, the that, that one you're going to lead or the lead agency on it as it is these days rather than primacy and so on um yeah. but i i don't think again in my opinion that a lot of our commanders have actually had this exposure yet to, yeah a certain number have but i think that's also part of what we need to get across to people how they can fit in with that wider wider area well i think the doctrine again the the doctrine that came out in december the new version is actually trying to encourage other agencies to lead now rather than yes yeah, yeah. The blue lights just driving the you know driving the meetings because they can it's yeah. really about, see i think there'll be a probably strong likelihood that in the future at some instance uh, strategic and tactical commanders from the nhs will be invited to lead so mm, the think. appropriate training that as we've seen very recently that can be quite a daunting experience even for a fire commander to be asked to well, leave and and i'm pretty sure that will be the case i mean you've only got to look back over the last five six years with things like ebola um good old yeah. brexit as we've already referred to um what's the what's that big one that's going on or still going on oh covid sorry um <laughs> Yeah, you know, the amount of meetings that we've already alluded to with that, and actually people being having to take 
you know, lead agency roles on those. Um, and I think that's where a number of these people are, uh, that we've got just need that understanding of how they can work with the other agencies, the partner agencies, um, and also quickly. Um, as I say, a lot of it actually is actually real communication, basic standards in how you do it. Best way of course is face to face. Here we are today, um, virtual, but that, that's the way it is. And um, I can hide behind the screen as opposed to stand up in front of an auditorium area. But uh, it's one of those points that I think we need to get more experience at and be more comfortable at. Well, I don't think strategic managers and tactical managers in NHS would not have the skills to run the meetings. I'm sure they do that every day. It's mm. just it's just the structure within the meeting. They probably, If they've not trained on it before, they will have mm. difficulty with when people are shouting JDC at them and JDM and iMarch. Yeah. And all the other stuff, which is bread and butter to most emergency services. Mm. If, uh, if the strategic tactical managers aren't trained on it, unaware of it, it can be a little bit daunting <laughs> to find out what the acronyms mean during a meeting rather than no yes. in advance. So it wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility if they're trained right that they would bring an eye march to the meeting. With uh, and that's it, and that's one of the one one of the points I think. Yeah, you know, as you've quite rightly said that you know all these acronyms are around. There is this lexicon of terms, you know, through the um, uh, through Jessup, uh, which is is absolutely massive. And I think I've probably said before to it on other occasions, it's not bedtime reading, but it's actually well worth having a, an understanding of that. You know what you would use methane for, what you'd even use an uh, yeah. II march for as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't at least think that understanding. Yeah, it's not a lack of skill and experience on their behalf. It's just a matter of training and understanding the process. But, mm. uh, we're a couple of minutes away from finishing. Really interesting, Ian. Oh. Uh, uh, if there That's are it. people like watching the webinar, if they want to pose a question now, um, um, we can answer those questions, or our facilitator will answer those questions for them. Other than that, it's been really interesting. Uh, so we've got a question. Um, a question would yeah. you agree that an important element of the JDM and TCG and SCG attendance is accountable decision making and recording the context and rationale? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that's drummed into emergency services is uh, the decision making and recording of decision making, because that really. Um, that really de uh, defines the um, the responsibility, accountability, doesn't it? And if I can just add to that as well, it's also making sure that you've got a command support um, to provide assistance in this. Because you know, my my own experiences are sitting around a table with a number of others. It can be quite um, quick firing that you need to actually have you know decisions logged and and other information logged and rationale behind them. So to actually have your own logist or access to a logist is also quite important yeah it's again something that's taken for granted in the emergency services but may at this stage of eprr training not be taken and not be well understood in the in the, in the nhs the wide nhs and uh, of course there is national recording forms for for those decisions so if you don't really understand the joint decision control it's hard to see how they will be recorded in the right way mm. Uh, but that was from Steve Gregory, that question. Thank you very much, Steve. Currently, we don't have any more questions, I think. Uh, so I think if if uh, I'm happy if uh, uh, nice to talk to you again, Ian. As I've seen, we were. And you. So, you know, we, we're, um, we, uh, we know quite a bit, a lot about what we're, we're doing in terms of fire, particularly mm -hmm. police and others. So thank you very much for that, Ian. And uh, thank you for the thank people you. that watched. Um, Hope you enjoyed it and uh, we'll see you another time. All right. Take care then. Bye for now. Bye-bye.